The first thing I learned using clickers was that my instruction was nowhere near as effective as I thought it was. A typical situation in my experience um, in a lecture class is that you have explained something and then you ask a question to the class about it and three or four people raise their hand and you call, usually people who are pretty knowledgeable, and you call on somebody and they give the right answer and then you say, well, did everybody hear what Sarah said and uh, do you understand uh, why she said it and so on and there people just sit there and then uh, you say, all right, let's move on. And you assume that uh, students have understood what you said, but in fact, you've only sampled a tiny fraction of the audience. And the clickers allow you to sample the whole class and find out immediately, for example, that half the people didn't get it, which you never will, would know otherwise. So what are clickers? Well, the technical term is an audience response device. And it's a little handheld device like a TV remote. And generally, they have five buttons on them, A, B, C, and D, so that the instructor can put up a multiple choice question on the screen in front of the class. And then everybody can click their answer. And the data goes right to the instructor's computer. And the instructor can then show a histogram, if he or she desires, uh, showing which of how many people answered A, how many answered B, and so on. So it's a way to get a response from the entire class rather than simply people who are willing to raise their hand in response to a question. I'll never forget the first time I posed an experimental clicker question after explaining something what I, in what I thought was a completely crystal clear manner, and half the students obviously hadn't understood it. And I was shocked because in the past I had always called on people on a few of them got it, and then I was moving on. So I, it was a humbling experience, and I learned not to trust my evaluation of how clear I was being or how well I was getting an idea across to the students. There are other ways to poll a class, obviously. You can ask people to raise their hands, how many like A, and so on. Uh, you can use colored cards, where A is red and B is green and so forth and people hold up a card uh, depending for their answer. But in all those cases, you're revealing what your choice is. And many students seem to be nervous about that. And the clickers are nice because, first of all, they're, it's absolutely anonymous. You could ask them an embarrassing question. You could say, so far, I have found this lecture fascinating, a waste of time, boring, so on. And students probably wouldn't give you an honest answer if they had to raise their hands. But on the clickers, You'll get the true, <laughs> the true stuff. And second, the data is all the data are all recorded in the computer, so that if one wants to go back and look at how people did on a question and what kind of distribution of answers there were, or do bio, do education research on the results, it's easy to do. The clickers are registered, and so the instructor has the clicker number, so you can go back and follow an individual student's responses if you want to using their clicker information. I think the most important thing, probably, with clickers is the kinds of questions you ask. I know uh, several colleagues who say, well, I tried clickers, and they didn't work very well. Uh, I didn't think the students were learning anything, and they didn't like them. And so I stopped. And almost always, the problem is that they were not asking interesting, challenging questions that required students to really think about the answer. Uh, some people use them simply to take attendance. It's a convenient way to know who's in class. Um, or uh, simply ask factual recall questions, which don't really benefit anybody. The students presumably just wrote down what you told them, and now you ask them to spit it back with a clicker question, and they can do that. But the students pref much prefer to have questions that really challenge them, in our experience. Let your brain think. You know stuff about this. How do plants use the oxygen gas, okay, oxygen gas that they release as a waste product of photosynthesis? photosynthesis? Do they, A, use it to build more sugar and glucose and chloroplasts? Do they, B, is it a direct source of energy for plants? C, is oxygen primarily released for animals to use in cellular respiration? 
D, is oxygen required for ATP production in the mitochondria of plants? And E, oxygen isn't used for anything by plants. So think for just 15 seconds. I'm going to time it. Benjamin Bloom showed many years ago that the, uh, probably the most effective instruction is one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And when it was, uh, people studied, well, what do really effective tutors do? What they do is they ask questions. They don't tell students the answers. And they lead students from one thing to the next by asking challenging questions that are just challenging enough so the students can get it with some effort, but not so difficult that they discourage the students. And uh, so it's interesting to think about how you can do that in a large class. And the clickers really allow you to do that because you can ask a series of questions of increasing difficulty and lead the students from one step to the next. Um, so that the students are getting this kind of interaction and you're not telling them the answer, you're letting them arrive at it uh, by a process of constructivist putting things together in their own minds. So I want to do a clicker question. This is one of the first clicker questions that I asked you when we started this transformations of energy and matter unit, which is that little green symbol on the left of every slide. What's the original source of all the energy in your body right now? Because we're about to move from talking about mass to talking about energy. So click. Clickety click. Still keep going, keep going. All right. I'm going to stop there. Well, let's see what it looks like. All right. Well, you've listened to me about nutrients. <laughs> if you can ask a question that's difficult enough so that half the class, for example, doesn't get it, you could explain it again, right? Um, you could just tell them the answer and move on. But what we've found and others have found is that by far the most effective thing to do is to ask the students to discuss it and debate it among themselves. Say, I t taught this to you, I explained this as clearly as I could and half of you apparently didn't get it, so talk to your neighbor and see if you can convince him or her that you're right and he or she is wrong. And uh, just have a little debate about it and then we'll re-vote. And almost inevitably when you do that, the percentage of correct answers goes way up. Here's a question that uh, we pose to the class and we ask them to think about it briefly and then cast a vote using their clickers. And here are the results following the discussion after students have had a chance to debate with each other and think about it, about it together. And in this case, the correct answer is C. And you can see that very few people got that the first time around, but that after the discussion, a majority of the students got the correct answer. And they arrived at it by this process of debating with each other and talking about it. I'm going to ask you to turn and talk to your neighbor, and I'm going to ask you to think about this question in a different way, and I'm going to ask you again. And it may not get us anywhere, in which case we're going to keep working on it. If this question said, where is the original source of all the mass that's in your body right now? Remember, I asked you two versions of this question, and it's the same choices. If I ask you the mass version, where's the mass of your body, where's the mass of a plant come from? then how would you answer that question? And then are you answering that question and not really reading energy, which is in capital letters and in red? OK, turn and talk to your neighbor. How would you answer this differently if it was mass? And is that confusing you? And then I'm going to ask you to click in again. During the student discussion, it's, I think, useful for the instructor to listen in on, on what's being discussed. You know, are they talking about the football game yesterday? or? Are they actually talking about the question, for one thing? So the instructor can circulate uh, if you have teaching assistants in the course or undergraduate learning assistants, then uh, that's a good time for them to interact with groups that are working on the problem. Uh, you have to train them not to give the right answer, but simply to try to encourage students and prompt them uh, toward the right answer. Click in one more time, one more time, click in one more time. I don't know if anybody's shifted. Click in one more time. 
We're about to start talking about energy, and energy is a very hard idea to get your head around. So that's why I'm asking this question again. <coughs> Clickety click, 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 click. All right. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Showing the results. Oh, what do you think? <laughs> All right. Even when peer discussion doesn't seem to be working, because students don't arrive at the right answer, it's still a very valuable piece of information for the instructor. It shows again that how valuable the clickers are to provide the feedback that lets the instructor intervene in a productive way and get the students to the correct understanding. So I would argue that the ultimate source of energy in your body is sunlight. Okay? The energy is what the plant... The students have been primed by the discussion so that even if they're... Um, so that they're receptive to really understanding the, the answer that you give or the explanation that you give at the end of the process. Okay. You've done that in many classes. It's capturing that sunlight energy in the light reactions, okay, then temporarily storing it in those little energy carriers, ADP, ATP and NADPH. So in this case, what Kimberly has done is take this information and provide a clear explanation that helps the students toward the correct understanding. One of my colleagues came up with my favorite three-word description of good teaching. She just says, ask, don't tell. And there's a lot of wisdom in that little statement. And it drives students crazy sometimes. They say, well, just give us the answer. You know, what is the right answer? And, uh, but they will learn much more if you ask them to come up with the right answer one way or another.